Open spaces, meadows, prairies, fields, and forests have been for millennia the natural living space for pollinators. Native bees, bats, birds, beetles, and butterflies have foraged, nested, and thrived through complex and biodiverse landscapes. Now modern civilization, with its large cities and industry, urban sprawl, and wide fields of agriculture, has caused pollinator habitat to shrink, and it is being lost at an ever-increasing rate. But this need not be where the story ends. There are many millions of acres of land under management. Power companies with right-of-way corridors and buffer zones are uniquely positioned to create large areas of pollinator habitat. These untapped areas have the potential to become one of the largest pollinator projects in history. There can be an abundant future for pollinators if we learn what they need and how to coexist with them. Here's how. Think of it as two different types of pollinators. We have the pollinators we manage, which is only a few species around the world, and then all of these other pollinators that are just out there doing their thing, and quite a few of them will visit crops and provide pollination. And those are our, what we call our wild or unmanaged pollinators. Our wild bees were here obviously long before honeybees came over, and they developed all these relationships with our local plants. So all the wildflowers have sets of bees, mostly, sometimes it's beetles, sometimes flies, that communicate with them, different sizes and shapes of flowers, different sizes and shapes of bees that go with them. Roughly 4,000 species in North America. We don't know the actual number because we don't have enough people studying bees, so we still have bees that don't have names yet, for example. Why are bees important? Just from our native habitats, you count up all the plants and ask, which of these plants requires some kind of insect, which is gonna be mostly bees, to move their pollen from plant to plant and pollinate them and produce the seeds for the next generation? And the answer is about 75%. So we're completely dependent on bees to create some of our forests, to provide wood, to provide all these wildflowers, and each of those plants has its role and its place within the environment that creates oxygen and systems that function well and have capacity to handle storm surges and wildfires and rebuild themselves when the ultimate disaster always happens to them. So a lot of that is dependent on these tiny little beings that we should be eternally grateful for. Bees provide a, a huge amount of the pollination service and it goes to the production of food. It's very human focused and human centric. What do I get out of this? Why do I care about pollinators? It's the food that I eat. It's a direct connection to me. Um, however, these pollinators also create seeds. So they create a seed or a flower product it has nothing to do with me directly, but the bird eats it or the possum eats it or the raccoon needs it. So while it's not creating food for me as a human, it is creating food and supporting these whole other systems. And ultimately these things all connect together. And so pollinators are, are not just important for agriculture and for the oranges and tomatoes and blueberries that we need and chocolate and coffee, but they create food that support all of these other species that we also enjoy on a daily basis. So a lot of times we don't have much information and understanding of our wild bees because there was no need to. Pollination was almost always a gimme a long time ago. So there wasn't really any need to study any of that. And so we didn't. And so now we're kind of catching up with learning about wild bees and figuring out how many there are, how to count them. The bulk of bees on this continent are in the ground. You literally are walking on thousands of nests of bees every year. It's just kind of interesting thing where they so dominate our environment, and yet we know nothing about them, and importantly, how they're doing. In case the honeybee disappears, something has to backfill. Not the honey, we can get that from other countries, but the pollination of our crops. And of course, our wild plants and flowers also need pollination too. In fact, we were able to do these calculations that basically assessed how important each pollinator species was to the crop pollination of a specific crop watermelon. And we found out that in the, that case where the farm was near natural habitat, the pollinator, the native pollinator community could provide everything that was needed for watermelon pollination. But out on those other farms, the ones I sort of call the industrial farms in the industrialized landscape, very few native pollinators and those farmers relied 
really on bringing in hordes of honeybees to do the pollination. The biggest issue with pollinator decline is, again, super easy, habitat loss. Cornfields, paved areas, cities, urbanized, mowed landscapes, all these kinds of things take us from a biodiverse area to a low biodiversity. The, the factor that drives all those kinds of changes are loss of flowers. So it's an outright loss of flowers. All bees are obligate pollen feeders, no flowers, no bees. But in addition to that, many bees are highly specialized. They only go to flowers of one particular kind. So the biodiversity of plants is going to directly be correlated with loss of bees. So bees and plants are codependent. For pollinators, the next big one is pesticides. And I would class them within the form of pollutants. They're not the target of the pesticides, but they are experiencing them. Wild bees are directly tied to our food security, if you will. There was a collapse in honeybee populations. There was what we call colony collapse disorder. It was really freaking everyone out. Beekeepers would go to formerly healthy hives, open up the hive and go, oh my God, it's just death in there. And some beekeepers were losing you know, up to 90% of their hives. So that was kind of frightening, but at the same time, it also elevated the reason for looking at these native pollinators and what they could be contributing and sort of seeing them as a backup plan or insurance plan uh, for crop pollination. But one of the things we do when we look at those farms is to look at the on-farm management uh, and to what extent that the on-farm management would support or promote uh, populations of bees coming from the farm, and that can be more diversified plantings, reduced pesticide and chemical use to allow for more diverse plants around the field. Then the other part is, what is the supply of wild bees that could come from outside the farm, so in the landscape? In places like in Pennsylvania, our collaborators have started recommending that hives aren't needed at all, no managed bees are needed because there's just enough bees in the landscape. Natural habitat supplies these native pollinators that provide important crop pollination. So we started asking the question, can we bring them back? How do we make sure that landscapes where organisms are thriving are connected to one another? If they get really isolated from one another, then we don't have gene flow, for example. If a species goes locally extinct, in this one patch, how's it gonna get recolonized unless there's an ability for the organisms to literally flow through the landscape? So power companies are great because you know they're dealing with another kind of flow. They're deal dealing with the flow of electricity across the landscape. And because of that, they manage land in a very connected way. I'm Lewis Payne. I work for the New York Power Authority, which is a state-owned utility in New York State. We have 1,400 miles, which equates out to about 16,000 acres of right-of-way that I manage. Uh, we manage that, that right-of-way corridor on a four-year cycle. Our job as vegetation managers is to manage the land. The whole realm of integrated vegetation management, there was, there was some scientists Back in the late 40s, Dr. Frank Egler was one. Rachel Carson was another. She understood the, the concepts of IVM on utility lines or highway rights-of-ways and the fact that you didn't have to get rid of all the vegetation out there to get to your end goal. You only needed to target what you needed to be taken out of there, whether it was tall trees into the power lines or tall vegetation along the road corridors. And from there, the science started evolving more and more. Actually, the companies have a fair amount of space to be advancing pollinator conservation projects on their land. Kind of the real estate assets that generally power companies oversee, there's their transmission lines. And there's about 5 million acres of habitat within transmission lines in the United States, approximately. And then there's a surplus property. And there's millions of acres in surplus property. When I mention that we are land managers out here, not only do we have these power line corridors, but we have a lot of other lands as well. The New York Power Authority has several large hydro facilities. And at these large hydro facilities, we have thousands of acres there. Thousands of acres that are either woodlots, campgrounds, different types of land. So as a land manager, we need to have a grasp on that. 
so that we are ensuring that those lands are being managed properly. Putting pollinator-friendly uh, seed mixes in costs money. It's not free, and then you have to figure out how to manage it. But you can also make the business case because over time you actually end up saving money because it's less maintenance. Once you have native vegetation in, and you're not out there all the time managing it and mowing it and taking out all the invasives on a regular basis, um, it can save you money over time. So the company owns a tremendous amount of right-of-way in northwest Indiana, and it intersects with a lot of natural areas. And there's a, a great opportunity for us to work with our neighbors and other conservation partners to restore habitat on our properties. We've been doing integrated vegetation management for a lot of years, and we've seen the benefits of that. And there's been other drivers that have come up over the years, and one of the big ones right now is the Dow Jones Sustainability. And within that, there's a biodiversity metric, and that's specifically targeted at how are we impacting threatened species and critical habitats and things like that. With the monarch butterfly, as that becomes closer to the listing decision, there's gonna be a lot of talk about that. And I think CEOs among a lot of these utility companies that are managing rights away and have habitat on those lands, they're gonna be asking each other what they're doing. I'm an environmental engineer for Arkansas Electric Cooperative in Little Rock, Arkansas. You know, sustainability and pollinators, it's the future and protecting them is of vital importance. There's a lot of opportunity because the interconnectedness of these properties and especially being in Arkansas, we are very important to the monarch migration. And so there's huge opportunity for landowners to connect their properties and give monarchs and other pollinators a way, a route to travel to when they travel to and from Mexico. And there's a lot of science that goes into finding the right seed mixtures and making sure it's going to survive water supply, that it gets, you know, the rain supports it. And so you're not wasting extra resources on replanting and rewatering and that is, is a successful pollinator plot. Because there's got to be a certain mix that's really the best habitat for pollinators. Because if I just have one plant species out there, it's not going to be enough for a pollinator to survive through the season. I want to look at the, the habitat as a whole. What other, what other things am I leaving out there? Am I leaving some bare soil spots? Am I leaving little puddles of water? It's all necessary for the pollinators. On one of our rights away that's adjacent to a wetland restoration area, we've got a right away that is required to be mowed because of a local mowing ordinance. And I think in that situation, we're definitely ahead because we would rather leave it go natural. That community is only looking at it from an ordinance perspective. And I think that's an opportunity for us to have a conversation to show them the value. And what can we be doing to put in habitat that supports species? Maybe there's some policies or even some laws that are archaic that say this is why you cannot have vegetation over five inches or six inches. Well, maybe we should relook at some of those things and say, is it a safety issue? Is it a business decision? Well, why are those, those previous policies in place? For corporations, they're also landowners. So the idea is to look at their landscapes and look at recreating them with some pollinator component, allowing some of the areas to become rewilded or naturalized. We are developing more solar projects, for example, and on the outskirts of these properties, them, some of our members have put pollinator habitat. So it is um, a growing concern and awareness, but there's still a lot more work to be done. When we manage landscapes for plants that help bees, you're also managing for thousands of other insects that we know very little about and are not in our common everyday understanding. They're just too obscure, but they're coming along for the ride. I'm on Team Wild Bee for this one because they're getting squeezed. I'd also really like to see us change our crop systems so that they can support native pollinators as well as honeybees. An incredible nexus here is that these lands, they are there. Let's use them in a way that also supports these species. They did it for free. They weren't paid. We didn't have to even study them. It was a given. But now things are a little more shaky. We can't just assume that all this is going to naturally equalize and that certain bees will recover, certain plants and such like that. Let me make a couple bold statements here. Integrated vegetation management is the way to manage vegetation on the right-of-way corner. We're not just system foresters out here. We've got another responsibility as an environmental manager because we have such biodiversity. An integrated vegetation management needs to be done on the whole system. I look at the bigger picture of how can these companies be working together to advance pollinator conservation. 
and we all realize that we're interconnected. The impact that we can have on the whole ecosystem out there is huge. And it's, it is effectualizing change. I've seen the change on the ground. I've seen these conservation projects implemented. Um, and it's really quite inspiring that, um, that we come together as a team. And when you look at it from that perspective, there's ways to hook up these land assets to create a much bigger ecological benefit than any one company can do on their own or any one stakeholder can do on their own. You can put together a million acres potentially by creating these habitat corridors and resting areas for pollinators across the country. We can have a huge impact for these species. And if we continue to manage it that way, they'll never disappear. They're always gonna be there. And that biodiversity on them is always gonna be there. This is an emerging issue and that's not going away. And more, more of the public is interested, pollinators all over the media. Like this, this is a real concern that if it's the right thing to do, to do our due diligence to protect pollinators. I think the momentum is building. I think everybody's seeing what other people are doing. The loss of pollinators and the loss of insects as a whole um, and how that impacts society, the more they're gonna be concerned, looking for that land to do that work on. And we've got a great opportunity to impact pollinators on our lands. So a biodiverse environment is all you really need to know. You don't even really need to know what bees you're helping uh, because if you plant plants, the bees will come. We have before us a unique opportunity to turn millions of acres of land into healthy pollinator habitat. If power companies and other land managers choose to work together, planting flowers and reducing chemical use across the landscape, we can bring back pollinators and with them a host of essential food and ecosystem resources and other facets of life.